Welcome to Bay Point. If this is your first time here, don't be scared. It's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. So we're going to continue on worship together now. So lift your hearts up. Lift your hands up if it feels good. Lift your eyes up to the heavens. Let's sing out to our God who truly is good and who is mighty to save. as Jesus broke bread with his brothers for the last time he said for the love you show one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples in other words they will know we are Christians by the way we love and yet more accurately oftentimes it should be they'll know we're Christians by the way we judge they'll know we're Christians by the way we condemn by the way we tolerate by the way we condescend and even by the way we hate but not in this house, not in this church. In this church, they will say, we know they're Christians by the way they serve, by the way they honor, by the way they accept, by the way they welcome, and by the way they love right here in this church. So we're going to sing this out. We're going to sing, shine a light so the world can see we're singing. So here we go. Let's raise our voices up. Shine a light. Shine a light. Can move the mountains 
Let's pray together before we go any further. Lord, thank you so much for this day. This day is not a guarantee. It's not a given. So we thank you so much for the blessing of this very day. Thank you for bringing us together. Thank you for helping us worship our socks off. We love you so much. You are here. You are present. And you are able. You are full of grace and mercy and love and forgiveness. And for that, we absolutely adore you. So thank you, Jesus. Bless the rest of our time together. Bless our time of learning. And Lord, we love you. And everybody who agreed said, amen. All right. Turn to someone else and say, welcome. You are welcome in this place. Senior pastor here at Bay Point Community Church. I'm Justin Van Reenen, the high school guy. And I'm Dave Thomas. I work with the middle school students. And you might see some of us uh, with uh, shaved heads. And we did that in support of Jake Melvin. He's a seventh grade student in our, in our ministry here at Bay Point. And uh, he's battling a rare form of cancer and recently started chemotherapy. So we wanted to do this, come alongside him and support him. Go team Jake. Go team Jake. That's right. Hi. I'm Elizabeth Vandermolen, the Director of Connections here at Bay Point. Uh, today in the program, you would have received the small group inventory. I would love to have you fill this out. It will tell me if you are in a small group already or if you would like to be part of a small group. In September, we are going to start a whole bunch of new small groups. And what this will do is it will allow me to communicate with you this summer. This is a place where a group of people get together and you get to study scripture together, you can learn together, you can study books and topics together, you can support each other, eat and have fun together. Um, pretty much you get to live, love and laugh together. So if you're interested, please fill this out and I will get back to you shortly. Thanks. If you've got a heart for local missions, we have an awesome opportunity for you coming up June 18th through the 22nd. We're going to be partnering with Freedom Builders for a local missions trip, a short-term missions trip, which uh, we're going to be helping people rebuild their lives. If you're not sure what Freedom Builders is, here's my friend Gary to tell you a little bit more about it. So Gary, what is it that, uh, that you're passionate about when it comes to Freedom Builders? Um, the biggest thing is uh, the people we serve. Um, we might rent their house a home. They uh, just watch the smile on their face when we get done serving them and helping them show that they're actually worth something. Tell me a little bit about the last people that you served. You were talking about a family that you served recently through Freedom Builders. They didn't really want our help. They, uh, they were kind of cold and just uh, life had not done them a good deal and uh, we went out and helped them and we were all done. We had over 60 people help him in one day in their house and when he came out of the house after everybody left he could not quit smiling and uh, it had been the first time I'd seen him smile in a while and 
We asked him why he's smiling so much. He said, did you see, did you see my home? And that was just, almost brought me to a tear. The short term mission trip takes place June 18th through the 22nd, and you can sign up for one day or all days whenever you can come. The cost is $50 per day or $200 for the whole week, and it just helps to provide materials that we're going to be building with. Also, no re experience required. You don't have to be a builder or a carpenter or an electrician. Just have available hands and a willingness to come and help. If you're interested, please come and sign up at the Compassion Table today. <laughs> uh, hey, just want to let you know we've got our second, uh, what I hope will be, annual trip out to Werfel Park for the Beach Bums. It's coming up on June 10. It's a fantastic family event. We're renting out the whole party deck. Um, it's $20 a person, but that gets you not only the ticket, it gets you their unbelievable food buffet. Basically, it's burgers and brats and potato salad and all that stuff, but it's a ton of fun, great family environment. And uh, I think we got about 100 tickets, thereabouts, and they are on sale at the Hub. And uh, I would go grab them because they're probably going to go fast. For more information about what's going on here at Bay Point, call the church offices at 922-9882, follow us on Facebook and Twitter, and check out our website at bponline.org. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you soon. So, what do you think of the new do? Huh? I, uh, <laughs> I, it's really funny because I've gotten comments from, you look like Forrest Gump in, in Tom Hanks, to my daughter who just said, Dad, you just look old, <laughs> to Julie Green who was here at the early service. I'm going with Julie Green who said I look like David Beckham. <laughs> I don't really think that's true, but I'm going with it. So, <laughs> you know, whatever. Uh, hey, one other thing uh, that I didn't put in, the, in the, uh, the, B, the Bay Point now is there's a Bible study, just in, in case you're interested, that's starting this Thursday, but it's during the day. So I'm kind of targeting the sort of empty nester retiree group, but really, you know, any age is welcome. And uh, we're going to be studying this kind of verse-by-verse study of 1 Peter. And uh, it's, so it's Thursday morning from 10 until 11.30. The Bible study itself will be 10.30 to 11.30, and 10 to 10.30 is just a gathering hangout time. So if you want to be part of that, um, uh, go on back to the hub. I think there's a place to sign up, and uh, hopefully we'll see you then. Uh, this book here, The Hole in Our Gospel, I read this a couple years ago. It rocked my world. I'm reading it again, and it's rocking me all over again. And uh, as, you, as I'm sure you know, this is the book that was the basis for the series that we're starting today called The Whole in Our Gospel. And uh, we, we purchased um, upwards of 300 copies of this book. We've never sold that many copies of a single book ever. And we still have copies left, but I'll tell you what, uh, even to the non-readers, if you're going, man, that book's more than 50 pages and there's not a lot of pictures, it's beyond me. Uh, find somebody who's a reader and have them read it to you. I'm not kidding. It's, it's, it's that significant. And that's six bucks. It's normally like $12.99. We got a huge discount. And they're available in the Ripples bookstore. This was the 2010 book of the year. And, and there's, there's a reason it was book of the year. And so I, I, I try not to overstate things because if you do, you lose credibility. So I'm going to say something that, that is bold, but I think it's true. This book here, which is based on this book here, which is the Bible, um, along with what you're going to be experiencing, not only through our weekend services, the music and video and teaching, but we have things planned for each week and each day of the week, Monday through Friday, you'll hear more about that at the end of the service, that's going to drive this deeper. And I believe that this cumulative series called The Whole in Our Gospel has the, the, the potential of changing this church and our lives forever in ways that very few series that we've ever done at Bay Point have, have that potential. I know that's a big, bold statement, but I, I believe it. And because of that, I want to just um, invite you to pray with me that at the very outset that God will do something irrevocable and supernatural in us and through us. So would you pray with me? Here we go. Father, we would ask right now, in the name of your son, Jesus, that you would grab hold of our hearts and our minds and ultimately our will. There is a volitional component to our faith. In fact, Jesus, you kind of echoed that in the Garden of Gethsemane when you were wrestling with your, with your crucifixion. And you said, Father, if there's any other way, 
for this cup to pass, then, then let it pass. But not my will, but your will be, be done. And so, Father, we pray together, you know, that the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray, and part of that was that your kingdom would come and your will would be done on earth, just like it is in heaven. So we pray, Father, that the will of your eternal kingdom would become the will of our lives and that it would be manifest, manifest here on earth, in and through us. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake. And everybody who agreed said, amen. amen. Now I want to uh, give special thanks and credit to our friends at Kensington Community Church. It's a church, large church in the metro Detroit area of multiple campuses. And we developed a very close friendship with them. Steve Andrews, who's their founding pastor, is an incredible guy. Dave Wilson, who is one of the founders and one of their teaching pastors. Dave and his wife Ann were up here, I think it was in February or March. And they did the Rock Your Marriage, that Dave Wilson. And uh, we've just got a great partnership. Well, they, they did this series at Kensington in February and March. And we had been thinking about doing it. And so I just, I just shamelessly went to Steve and said, you guys have a ton of resources. Can we just borrow? And he said, have at it. So we owe a big debt of gratitude to our friends at Kensington. In fact, Steve, uh, who spoke here two years ago, and Dave Wilson, who spoke here last year, as well as the Rock Your Marriage um, seminar. They're part of a teaching team, just like we have a teaching team here at Bay Point. Their teaching team read that book and they sat down and they, uh, they, they shared what this book had done in their own lives. So I would invite you to take a look at the side screens and listen in. Staggering to think that if you own a car, have a place to sleep tonight, that puts you in the top 2% wealthiest people in the entire world. It just feels like, is there, is there anything? Are we ever going to make a difference? Can we ever make a difference? And I'm amazed at how indifferent my heart is. I care, but I don't care enough to think about it every day. I immediately feel guilt. I know that's going to be really easy for a lot of us to fall into that category. It's like the blind spot of the church, but it's my blind spot. I just feel an enduring commitment. It used to be like numbers, and now it's love. The gospel's actually great news, because as evil as we are, it means God absolutely loves us. And not just us, he loves the world. And so if the world is so broken, and God loves the world, what does he expect of us? He wants me to do something, not just sit there and just contemplate and just say oh, how bad it is. What am I going to do about it? We're the ones that are supposed to be bringing healing and wholeness to this world. Something I've been haunted by for, for decades, to be honest with you, is just this idea that I'm going to get to heaven someday and realize how far I've missed it. Yeah, I've asked myself a hundred times in my life, why has God blessed me so much? And now I know the answer. So that would be a blessing. A big piece of this is obedience, is when God starts moving, is that you just don't push it off, you don't say, I have all these excuses, but to be obedient to what God is calling you to do. God's looking for us to begin a lifestyle where our lives are lived really, truly other-centered here and around the world. And I really believe that God's speaking to people individually about individual issues. first chapter in the whole in our gospel, a guy takes scissors to the Bible. He cuts out every verse that has to do with wealth or poverty or injustice or the oppressed. He ends up cutting out 2,000 verses of the Bible. Sort of looks like this, and I was thinking, how many of us have lived our lives as if these verses never existed? <laughs> when the church is functioning properly, it's an unstoppable force. Yeah, and it should be. I mean, in any crisis, in any situation, you would hope the church would be the first ones at the doorstep. What good is it when you look at your brother and say, go and, you know, be warm and well-fed and not give what is needful to the body or to the stomach? What good is it? You say, that's not faith. These people around the world, people in America are tempted to look at pity on them. 
when we've gone and met these people, these people are not only joy, they're brilliant. Their strength, their endurance, their ability to face hardship. And if we were to mobilize them, they're gonna have a greater impact on the world than we will. So I'm reading this book and I'm just confronted with God's heart for the poor, and for the oppressed. And I'm thinking, man, I've been to seminary, I've read the Bible, I've taught the Bible for years. I couldn't believe it. I literally said to myself, oh crap, how could I miss the heart of God? And I think one of the questions is, as followers of Christ and as a church, are we brave enough? Are we brave enough to step into our selfishness and then give our lives away? Courage is contagious. If one man, one woman will say, I will do something, often that, that little nudge in the other person says, well, if they'll do it, maybe I can do it. We can do something about this, but will we? Will I? Yeah, I hope for us and I hope for Kensington that we'll stare at the world's problem, see how broken it is, and we won't look away. We'll look right at it, honestly. Maybe some of us the first time say, wow, it's unbelievably dark. We will at the same time stare into the face of God and realize that he says, I have an answer. I am the answer, but I want to use you as the solution to take me to the world. And I hope that I and we, or Kensington, would say, I am going to be brave enough to look into my own heart and confront my own selfishness and do something and absolutely trust God to use me as his face and his hands and his feet and us to change this problem. We can do it. We can absolutely make a difference in our lifetime. So what are we going to do? The world is watching. So from and I think that that last statement is absolutely true. Maybe in w w unparalleled ways, the world is absolutely watching. Um, unfortunately, what a, a lot of people, this is one of the reasons why I shy away from using the word Christian and Christianity, because it's associated with anti this and judgmental. And I try to say, no, 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 we're followers of Jesus. But if we're really following Jesus, there is a world watching as to whether or not we do have the courage, whether we're brave enough in some cases, to confront my own selfishness and self-absorption and to move not away. Because, I, I mean, this is ugly, hard stuff in some cases. Man, we, there's some stuff going on in the world that's like, I would rather not know about it. It's just uncomfortable. But with a watching world, the question remains, will we, will we be brave enough? And I, I have to echo the sentiment of, of, of the, the, the teaching team down at Kensington. It's kind of embarrassing. Because I've, I'm like Dave, man. I've, I got my master's and my doctorate and read the Bible through cover to cover umpteen times and have taught the Bible. And it's not, that I, it's not that I've been oblivious to God's heart for the poor and the oppressed and widows and orphans. I mean, how can you read the Bible and not at least get some of it? But what's been a little shocking and unnerving to me is, is uh, I, I just somehow failed to, to feel the extent of God's heart for the poor. And it, it, what's occurred to me in recent years, because I've been able to travel a little bit. In fact, uh, Bill Hybels, who's the founding pastor of Willow Creek, I listened to a, 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 a leadership um, thing that he did, and he said, if you're a senior pastor of a church, you need to do at least one international trip a year so that your heart gets wrecked. Because when you, then you, for, you see, you come back and then you forget. And he said, you've got you've to gotta move towards the suffering and the pain if you're going to be motivated enough to do something about it. And see, once you see it, you touch it, you smell it, you taste it, it changes you. Amen? Maybe some of you, maybe you've not, you've not done that, but I'm telling you, it does. In, the, in this book, The Hole in Your Gospel, there's an interesting statement about Thomas Jefferson, who was the third president of the United States. And it's said that Thomas Jefferson was a, he was a, um, he was a rationalist, meaning that he did not believe in miracles. So what he did is he took, he took the, the Bible and all the references to miracles in the New Testament or the supernatural work of God. He just took a razor and cut it out. And then he ended up with an enormous hole in his Bible, a hole in his gospel. And that might be scandals, like, I can't believe anybody would desecrate God's word, do that to it. But I, I doubt any of us have actually ever gone through the Bible and cut out the somewhere around 2,000 references to the poor. But... For a long time, especially the evangelical church, has kind of, largely, ignored it. I, I, I remember, I'm old enough to remember the 60s and the 70s, and there was a kind of social gospel movement that kind of permeated the more, I hate to use labels, but kind of more mainstream liberal denominations. 
that was a movement where there was kind of a focus on social justice, but Jesus got left out of the equation. And, and that's not the gospel either. But man, when you look at some of what the Bible teaches, and it's not just about the poor and the oppressed and widows and orphans. I mean, I, honestly, this is not a talk about sex, but when I look at the practices, our sexual practices, not just in our culture, but among those who call themselves followers of Jesus, and I look at what God's word teaches in this book, I'm drawn over and over to a statement that Jesus made in Luke's gospel, Luke chapter 6, 46, when Jesus said to those who consider themselves disciples or followers, he said, look, why, why do you call me Lord, Lord, when you don't do what I say? What does that even mean to say that Jesus, the word Lord means master. And if somebody's a master and he gives you an order and you're a servant, you, you don't debate it. When the master says jump, you say how high on the way up. Amen? That was really weak. Amen? <laughs> See, the, the fact that we don't respond, it's like we don't live in a world with, with, with like masters and, and servants, but that's a world of, of, the, of the scripture. And, and so when, when we look at God's heart, when we really look into the scripture and see over and over references to the poor and the oppressed and the imprisoned and the marginalized, widows and orphans. I mean, there's a sense in which I, I wonder if the Spirit of God has not been saying to the church, the evangelical church, for a long time, why, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and completely ignore that which is so precious to my heart? And I, I think the answer is blinders. We all have them. And I think if we just acknowledge it, and in some ways, then repent and, and get on with it will be a whole lot better. So over the next few weeks, we're going we're gonna to take a look at this hole in our gospel. And it's going to require of us a level of humility. It's going to require a level of courage. It's going to require of us a thirst for truth that, that causes us to, to not, not run away, but to run toward the truth. Jesus said the truth... Uh, um, you will know the truth, and then he, he said, you'll know the truth, and the truth will what? That's right. The truth will set you free. Somebody else, I don't know if it was in this book or I read it somewhere else, but somebody said, you'll know the truth, and the truth will make you flinch. And then it will set you free. And I think in some cases it's true. And uh, I wonder if we have the courage to flinch a little bit. I wonder if we have enough brave-hearted men and women and teenagers and children in this church to stare it down. In fact, um, one of the things that I uh, that love from, this, from the book, The Hole in Our Gospel, is a quote from the founder of World Vision. The guy who wrote the book is the current president, but not the founder of World Vision. Uh, Rich Stearns is the president. The founder was Bob Pierce. Bob Pierce coined a phrase that became a prayer. And I memorized this prayer. I'm not big on memorized prayers because it's my background, and those memorized prayers just became so wrote that it, they didn't, they kind of lost their meaning. But bring this next slide up. Bob Pierce said, let my heart be broken by the things that break your heart, O God. Would you, would you say that with me? Let my heart be broken by the things that break your heart, O God. Now, keep that slide up because that, that's a statement that I actually hope, I hope that becomes a prayer that you memorize and pray many times. I, I find myself praying that all the time. And so I'd like us to read that one more time. But this time, I'd like you to just pray it with me. You know, whether it's deep in your heart or you're just doing it because I asked you to do it, but just let's just make this a prayer. Here we go. Let my heart be broken by the things that break your heart, O oh God. And I, I hope that, man, that just gets deep, deep into the bloodstream of your life in this church. Now, we're talking about the gospel, a series called The Whole in Our Gospel. And, and the word gospel has a meaning. It means, in English, we translate it good news. But it's more than good news. It's like, you got to be kidding me, crazy, outrageous good news. That was like not even close to how radical it is. This is, I should be doing cartwheels. Actually, I shouldn't. But you know what I'm saying? You know, like cartwheels across the stage, like, wow, like, you got to be kidding me, confetti falling, you know, take your breath away, good news. Now, and, and, now, some of you, when you hear the word gospel, you don't even know what it means. You weren't raised in the church. You don't know the language. And if, if you were not raised in the church, the word gospel is kind of fuzzy. That's like totally awesome because we started this church to reach like unchurched people, people who don't know the deal. 
And so I'm really glad that you're here, that you're watching on YouTube or whatever. But for many of you, uh, you were raised in like various Protestant backgrounds, Baptist, uh, Methodist, uh, Lutheran, Pentecostal, whatever. And many of us were raised with a version of the gospel that went something like this. Jesus is the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus left heaven. He arrived, took on human flesh on a day we call Christmas, lived for about 30 plus years. He did miracles. He taught things that rocked the world. He was arrested. He was crucified. And then on Easter morning, he rose from the dead. And those who are willing to place their trust in what Jesus Jesus did on the cross where he died a substitutionary death so that our sin could be forgiven, our offense before a holy God could be wiped out, we then would receive the gift of eternal life and be with him in heaven when we die. Okay, now how many of you were raised with a background that sounded something like that? Show of hands. Somebody, okay, lots of hands going up. Now that was not my background. My background sounded something like this. Be good or the nuns will knock the snot out of you in the name of the Holy Trinity. Amen. That, that's, just, that's just my background. But Richard Stearns kind of challenges the idea that the gospel is about praying the prayer and doing the deal and then getting on with your life. Because while it's true that receiving God's pardon through the substitutionary death of Jesus is the gospel, it, it is the gospel in the sense that the gospel is about the totally unearned, unmerited, radical love of God. But it's also true that the gospel that transforms us inwardly is also the gospel that must be lived outwardly. And Richard Stearns writes in the whole of the gospel, he says, more and more, our view of the gospel has been narrowed to a simple transaction marked by checking a box on a bingo card at some bre prayer breakfast or coming forward during an altar call. And I don't think he's dogging the person who's, you know, praying a prayer or, or an altar call or whatever at a prayer breakfast. I don't think that's the point. I think he would say that's a good thing. He might even say that's the first thing, but I know he would say it's not the whole thing because it falls short of a full understanding of the word Gospel, euangelion in Greek, good news. So if you have your Bible, turn with me to Luke chapter 4. And there are Bibles provided under many of the seats. But in, uh, Luke, is a, it's in the New Testament, it's the third book, Matthew, Mark, Luke. Find Luke chapter 4, and while you're looking that up, a little context, this is a passage that takes place in Jesus' hometown. Now, quick little Bible trivia as you're looking it up. Okay, you're leafing through Luke chapter 4. A little Bible, Bible trivia, Jesus was born in what town? Born in Bethlehem, but where was he raised? Nazareth. Very good. So this takes place in a place of worship. Now, the, the Jewish place of worship, the big temple was the temple in Jerusalem, but they had, these, they had these other worship centers in towns just like we have, you know, sanctuaries or auditoriums or whatever. What was the local Jewish worship center called? It's called the synagogue, right? And their day of worship was called what? The Sabbath. Okay, good job, you guys. So we're talking about Jesus in his hometown of Nazareth. He's at the local synagogue, and it's the Sabbath. And on the Sabbath, they would take the text, the, the, uh, the Old Testament was their Bible, and um, on this particular day, they took the scroll of Isaiah. Literally, it was a scroll, and they would have unrolled it. And the text that day was Isaiah chapter 61. So in Luke chapter 4, Jesus is reading the scripture, but it's out of uh, Isaiah 61. Now, if you were a dignitary, if you were a, uh, an esteemed rabbi, and you happened to be in the the, uh, the crowd that day, they would often invite you to read the scripture. So the Bible tells us that they gave Jesus the scroll of Isaiah and he opened it up and he read these words. This is recorded in Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19, but it's out of Isaiah 61. Here's what it says. The spirit of the, of the, some translations say, of the sovereign Lord, but the spirit of the Lord is upon me for he has anointed me. The Greek word there is like chrisen. Uh, it, it, it means to empower or to anoint, but the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has a, anointed me to do, and there's five things here. And it's, it's not that, there are, there, that it's limited to these five, but there, there are five things that are listed here. The Spirit of the Lord has anointed me to, number one, bring good news to the poor. Secondly, he has um, sent me to proclaim the, uh, that captives will be released. Third, that the blind will see. Fourth, that the oppressed will be set free. And then finally, that the time of the Lord's favor has come. Now, when Jesus finished with that, he did something that just, well, what, what he did next was very predictable. He would have rolled up the scroll, and he would have uh, given it back to the attendant, and then he would have sat down. 
Okay, so he would have sat down because that's what the, that's what the teachers did. They, I usually stand, sometimes I sit, but they would have sat down. And then particularly because this was a messianic text, this was about something the Messiah would fulfill. One day Messiah would, would give sight to the blind and would, would bring good news to the poor and set the captives free. So Jesus sits down and literally they would have been on the edge of their seat with bated breath. What's he going to say next? You could have heard a pin drop. So before I go any further, I want you to give me your best bated breath on the edge of your seat. Because we're not going any further until I get it from you. So come on, guys. This is congregation participation time. Even in the back row, you guys back there, get edge of your seat. Come on now. I want you leaning forward like, what's he going to say? It's pretty good. Yeah, we should get a picture of this. This is cool. All right? So then, and here's what he says. They're like, and he says, you have to remember, stay there. This prophecy of Isaiah was 700 years old. They've been waiting a long time. You think you've been waiting for your dreams to come true? 700 years. And they're leaning forward. And Jesus says, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your Midst. Boom! And they're like, what did he just say? Okay, you can sit back now if you want. Or if you want to sit on the edge of your seat, that's cool too. But, but, but you have to understand, uh, this. You, I cannot overstate the impact of that statement. It's kind of like, um, have you seen on TV, you know, they have these shows, or maybe you've seen a clip on you, YouTube or whatever, but these people who are men and women who are in the military, they're, they're uh, stationed abroad in Afghanistan, Iraq, or whatever, and then they come home, but their family doesn't know. Have you ever seen those clips? And, and there's like this, ah, you know, the shock and the tears and all that. And, but usually before the eruption, there is this kind of disequilibrium. Like you, it's kind of like looking at me today. It's like, is that Nick? Or what? You know, it's just, it's just kind of weird. And then dad's there, but he's supposed to be in Iraq, or mom's supposed to be in Afghanistan. And there's this shock. You have to take that scene in the in the synagogue and multiply it by about ten thousand. It's just unbelievable. Then there's been some ongoing debate about the content of, of this quote from Isaiah that Jesus gave in, in Luke chapter 4. For instance, it mentions that the, 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 the Messiah, God's anointed one, would come and it would bring good news to the poor. So the question has often been debated. So are we, talking, are we talking about, like, this is good news for those who are poor in spirit? They're just kind of spiritually, like, in the dumps and they have no purpose in their life? Or, or might God actually be talking about good news for those who are not just poor in spirit, but just poor? And, and, and what, about, what about when it says that, that, that the Messiah would come to set the captives free, the prisoners free? Did that just mean like spiritual freedom because we're trapped by our sin and we're in a spiritual ditch? Or, or might that actually include other kinds of freedom? See, because we think that, well, Jesus was a spiritual guy. He came from heaven. And, uh, and he was concerned about spiritual things and the forgiveness of sins, that when we die, we can go to be with him in heaven. And while that's all true, we kind of treat Jesus like he didn't really give a rip about the concerns of this world. And you can go down that road until you come to that statement from Isaiah that's included in Luke's gospel where it says, uh, the Messiah says, I came to give sight to the blind. And again, you can say, well, okay, so Jesus came to to illumine, to give spiritual illumination to those trapped in spiritual darkness. And that was certainly me. I was not born blind. But I was, I was blind. I mean, it's like amazing grace. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. That was absolutely true of my life. Um, but, but then you run into these stories in the gospel of Jesus, like literally giving sight to blind people. It happened a couple times. They say, well, you know, if he actually did that with, with blind people, is it possible that he literally came to set prisoners free, both spiritually and physically? And to that, I would say absolutely Yes. In fact, I've got to give a shout out to a guy who I met once, just briefly, ever so briefly. And he died this past April, and he was a huge influence in my life through his writings and his life. And his name is Charles Colson. Mr. Colson was once one of the most powerful men in the world, and he ended up in a federal prison because of crimes he committed during the Watergate era. And through that experience, he came to faith in Jesus, and he went on to become one of the great Christian thinkers of the late 20th and early 21st century. And among other things, uh, his prolific writings. Uh, he was something of a prophet to our culture. In fact, we're going to be showing a worldview series starting in 
July on Thursday night, right? I mean, it's unbelievable content. You'll be hearing more about that in the coming weeks, but we should totally pack this room out. It's so good. But he also started an international ministry called Prison Fellowship. And um, through Chuck's tireless work on behalf of the incarcerated, thousands of men and women all over the world have been set free, not just spiritually, but physically as well because of the transforming love of the gospel. And my point is this. In Luke chapter 4, Jesus comes with a message that it's not just about the life to come. It's about that, but it's about more. He comes with a message of hope for people suffering in this world right now, victims of poverty, injustice, disease, and so forth. Jesus' message was one that says, you're not alone. I am the God incarnate. I'm a God who's, who, who, uh, who you know, loves you from a distance. I'm a God who will come and love you up close. I am the God who will die for you. And I'm going to send my Holy Spirit into the world. And I'm going to launch a movement called the church. And I'm going to mobilize and I'm going to empower my people all over the world. Help is coming. Help both for this life and the next. And that message of good news for the poor and freedom for the oppressed and sight for the blind and hope for the hopeless and forgiveness of sin for everybody was at the epicenter of Jesus' message. But we, we so often miss a huge part of that, in part because as Americans, we live in the most prosperous country in the history of the world, and our consuming passion for many of us has been not the pursuit of the kingdom dream, that God's kingdom would come and his will would be done on earth as it is in heaven, but our dream has been kind of the American dream, and we know about the American dream, and that American dream isn't of itself Bad. Let me illustrate it this way. This ladder is kind of the American dream, and we're climbing this ladder. So for many of us, the first step is an education. You know, and that education gets us a a, a good job. And so you got that graphic up there with money. And a lot of people still, a lot of college graduates, I'm told that they still think that um, when they graduate, their starting salary is going to be on average $59,000. You guys laugh at that? Yeah, probably for good reason. A lot of key, people with bachelor's degrees and they're all going on to grad school, not because that was their plan, but just because there's, there's, there's no $59,000 jobs to start. So anyway, you get your, you get your education, you get your job. Next thing is you, you get your, uh, yourself the, your honey, your man or woman of your dreams. And then maybe the next step up is you get sweet wheels. Now, I'm from Metro Detroit. I miss that step. I just have never had, I got a sweetheart. But I did, I've never really had any sweet wheels. She was the one who had the sweet wheels. When I met Rose, she had a 69 burnt orange Firebird. Nice. So anyway, after that, you go on. The next step is you get a sweet house. Somebody, I don't know who did this research, but this cracks me up. Somebody said that in America, for you to really be happy and content, you have to have a, the minimum square footage for your happiness is 2,000 square feet and up. Now, that's interesting to me because my wife and I live in a house that's over 2,000 square feet. Not tons over that, but it's bigger than that. But we have a son and a daughter-in-law and a daughter and a son-in-law, and they both live in houses that are significantly less than 2,000 square feet. That means that we are, like, wildly happy and our kids are miserable, right? (laughs) Wrong. Anyway, so that's the American dream. Then you throw in like vacations and retirement with endless golf, and you have got the American dream. But here's the crazy thing about that. This is nuts because we've learned it over and over, and we forget it over and over, and then we learn it and we forget it. And that is that while uh, cars and education and houses and vacations are not in and of themselves bad, they will never, ever, ever Fulfill what we crave more than anything, which is significance and a sense of purpose and meaning and ultimately God's unconditional love and, and favor. But we keep, we keep thinking that it will. We keep pursuing the American dream over God's dream. And sometimes I think we're like junkies. We're like money, sex, and power junkies. We just keep going after it and we keep climbing this ladder and we get to the top and go... It didn't promise, it didn't deliver what it promised. And so we, you know, some of us, we uh, climb off that ladder. We do some reevaluating and some reflecting and go, maybe there's another way to live. And so for, for some of us, not all of us, for some of us, we go, ah, well, ah, there's another ladder. Let me introduce you to the Christian American dream. This is, this is just, this is pretty much this with some Jesus sprinkled on it. Okay, so it's like, this. now we start climbing this one. It's like, okay, not only do I want all this, but in addition to that, I want a sweet, I want an awesome church with state-of-the-art facilities. 
And in addition to that, I want a church with an awesome communicator. We're still looking for one of those, but maybe someday. And then I, I want a church where there's awesome music that just rips my heart out. And then you add to that, I want a church that has awesome ministry for children and awesome ministry for for students. And I want a church where I leave every week feeling awesome about me. I want to go to Awesomeness Community Church. <laughs> you know, and as I think about that, I'm not so sure that if you break down those individual things or these individual things, it's not like that they're wrong. I mean, I don't, I don't want to go to a church where, where there's lousy music and horrible facilities. And, you know, I mean, those, those things aren't in and of themselves good or bad, but if we're not careful, both those ladders end up being kind of slightly different versions of the same thing. It's, it's really all about me. It's, it's, it's really all about me. And when it's all about me, it's never really all about God's kingdom. And you, you stop and you say, how many rock stars and movie stars and sports stars and even pastor stars have climbed both of those ladders and crashed and burned? It's like, are we ever going to get this figured out? So, you know, sometimes when we go, all right, there is a hole in our gospel and we move toward, you know, those areas of life, those people, those regions of the world where it's just gut-wrenching. Sometimes um, when we are confronted with the reality, the hard reality of widows and orphans and there's something like 10 or 20,000 sex slaves just in the red light district of Kolkata where we work with Freeset. I mean, you start looking at some of that stuff, and I don't know about you, but sometimes I've even gone like, God, you're God. You own the cattle on a thousand hills. Do something. Have you ever said that or thought that? Because uh, I have. And I think sometimes God looks at me and says, Nick, why don't you do something? I mean, what do you mean, why don't I do something? I sent my son. He died for you. I sent my Holy Spirit. He's empowered tens of millions of my children all around the world. You've got the expertise. You've got the time. You've got the resources. I mean, I know that Jesus is the answer, but Jesus is saying, you're the solution. You can't do everything but do something. My people are the solution. But if my people are going to be the solution, we have to step back and ask ourselves, what ladder are we climbing? So I want to break this down specifically to, to one of the things that Jesus said in Luke 4 about, about freeing the imprisoned. Because last year I went to the Grand Traverse County Jail, where there's probably usually about 130 people in the jail there. And they, they asked me to come down and speak every once in a while, and I, and I say yes every time I can. Um, they're, they're actually very appreciative and receptive. I don't know if they're appreciative just because they can get out of their cell. I don't really care. I'm just glad that they're there. And plus, I have a captive audience. You know what I'm saying? Nobody gets up in the middle of my talk and walks out to use the bathroom, use their cell phone, check their email, get coffee. I mean, they're, they're like locked in. You know? <laughs> they're so polite. They don't go anywhere. It's amazing. So anyway, so, so I, I, I walk in. This is, I don't know, four or five months ago. And I, I see a guy. I looked at him and he looked at me. I'm like searching through the Rolodex of my mind. And I looked at him again, and he looked at me, and he dropped his face. Some years ago, Rose and I, we bought a, it was a spec house. It was under construction. We bought it. It was our builder. I don't know what he did, but he messed up. And, and the, the sense of shame that had come over him was just, it just wrecked me when I looked into his eyes. I have a friend in our church who's going to be going to prison. He messed up. Some of you have friends and sons and daughters, parents, whatever, who are in prison. They messed up. But if, my, if I understand the gospel at all, the whole gospel, that whole gospel says we've all messed up. Amen? We've all messed up. And some of us have messed up where, like, if we got caught, we'd have a misdemeanor or felony record as well. And so I think that gospel says, don't forget about those in prison. It could, have been, it could be you. Don't forget about those who, who, who are in bondage. You know, in, so, in many cases, uh, because of no wrongdoing on their own, don't forget about them. 
enter into their world of pain and suffering so that one day there will be freedom and joy and laughter once again, not just spiritually, but physically as well. I don't know if you have seen the film starring Liam Neeson. I think it came out a couple years ago called Taken. Some of you seen it? It's a story of a, of a, of a the, the parents were divorced and the daughter was, I think, a high school senior. And she hoodwinked her dad, told her dad she's going to go to Europe with the, the, the family of, of, of a friend, but it wasn't the family. It was just her and another girl. So she lies to dad. And everything inside dad's going, don't let her go, don't let her go. But the daughter and the mom gang up and dad finally uh, let's her go. Well, no sooner does she get off the, the plane in, in Paris than some smooth-talking guy schmoozes her, and she ends up um, basically being sold as a sex slave to a wealthy gentleman from the Middle East. And Liam Neeson, turns out, in this movie, is a retired special ops guy, so he sets out to find his daughter. And if you see it, if you've seen the movie, you know, he kills all the bad guys. And I'm like, Yes! Now, I know I'm a pastor and I'm supposed to be all about grace and mercy, but I'm like, <laughs> You know what I'm saying, dads? Come on, you know what I'm saying. So he puts a bullet in the head of this one guy and she, in this drug-induced stupor, collapses into her father's arms and she says, Daddy, you came, you came. I can't believe it, you came. You know, and for me, it could be a movie clip like that or it could be a song, but there are these moments where you go, that's a gospel moment. I know we call it a secular film, but that's a gospel moment. In that moment, I went, that's it. That's what our Father did for us. In our state of lostness and brokenness and rebellion and crazy, stupid stuff we do, he came. And guess what? The extremely poor of the world the women and children caught in sexual slavery, those who live on less than a dollar a day, the oppressed and the imprisoned, the widows and the orphans, they're asking, is anybody coming for me? You see, when it's your daughter, when it's your child, when it's your friend who's in trouble, you drop what you're doing. You don't care what it costs. You go running because it's personal. When you hear of a child who's abducted, or a child who gets cancer, it might sadden you, but it doesn't rock you. It rocks you when it's your kid, when it's your spouse, then it's personal. As a video at the beginning of the service said, I got my head shaved this week because a 13-year-old young boy in this church, 13 years old, in fact, we've got a picture of him. That's Jake Melvin. He's just an awesome kid, and he was diagnosed with a form of cancer so rare that they think there's less than 100 known cases in history ever of that kind of cancer. It's really, really serious. And, you know, you hear about that, and you go, man, that's a terrible, he's 13 years old, that's terrible, but I'm telling you, you might feel sad, but if you're Jake's sister, Kate, if you're Jake's mom, Linda, if you're one of Jake's friends, it wrecks you because it's personal. And what I want to communicate to us this morning, friends, is that Jesus who doesn't just look down from heaven because he's here among us. The Bible says where two or three are gathered in his name. He's among us through his Holy Spirit. But Jesus looks down on this world. 15 million AIDS orphans in sub-Sahara Africa and people eating dirt cookies. You've got to come back next week. I'm going to introduce you to something called a dirt cookie. They eat dirt cookies in Haiti. They're that hungry. And when, you, when we live in a world with single moms all around us hanging by a thread and children at schools like Traverse Heights that don't have a single adult to give a rip about them. And we live in a world where there's millions of people in that strata called the 1040 window who have never even heard of the name of Jesus and they're living in bondage and voodoo and superstition and gods and goddesses coming out of yin-yang. And I want to tell you, for Jesus, it's, it's personal to him. And he wants it to be personal for us. And so let me wind this up with a couple next steps. And this is, the, this is really the heart of this series. If this, if this series is going to be transformational, it's going to be not just what happens here on Sunday, though I think it's going to rock. It's going to be what happens next. So let me just mention, again, if you have not, first step, pick up a copy of this book if you don't have it. And some of you might want to join a book study that's going to be meeting uh, in the prayer room. It starts a week from this Sunday night. If you want to be part of that study, uh, just go to the, to the uh, hub and, and sign up. And, and, but that's the first step. Read this book and, and ask God to reveal to you the blind spots in your own life. The second thing is critical, and it's this. 
There's going to be a weekly challenge and a daily devotional. And it's going to be sent to everybody who's part of our email. So if we don't have your email, you've got to go to the hub and give us your email address. Because here's what's going to happen. We're going to send you an email with a link to our website. And our website has a weekly challenge for each week and a, and a daily devotion. In fact, if you, do not, if you do not have access to the web, there are copies that look like this. It says, week one, my blind spot. And they're available at the hub. But don't everybody run and take them because we haven't made that many. We want to drive people to our website. That's where the communication takes place. But let me tell you what the weekly challenge is this week. You guys ready for this? Your, you are, your job this week, this is like Mission Impossible, if you're willing to accept it, is to be a blessing ninja. Watch Okay? You know, like ninjas? <laughs> that was really bad, wasn't it? My, my wife loves it when I do stupid stuff like that. She actually doesn't. But. So here's the deal. Here's the, here's the challenge. I want you, at whatever level, it could be 50 cents, it could be a dollar, five dollars, ten dollars, I want you to take a wad of cash. And I want you to take that same amount and put it in your pocket every day, Monday through Friday. And I want you to go out with your spiritual antennas up. Because this, if we do this, this will rock. Because what it will do is it will cultivate an awareness of hurting people all around us. And they're not all necessarily hurting. Like, like you might, maybe you have $2 a day that you can budget, $10 for the week. And so if you're traveling, some of you drive and you're in sales and you might hit a toll booth and it's a buck or two bucks and you just pay for the person behind you. You don't know that person's hurting or not, but you just, you just be a blessing ninja. And I'm going to go over to a coffee shop that I go to quite often and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give them 10 bucks and say, the next person who comes in, I don't know who it'll be, but some of you are going to be tailing me around. I want to come in after Nick. <laughs> and... Uh, and, and so, so what we want to do is just be blessing ninjas. If you have no money, maybe, I don't know, bake cookies and drop it on a neighbor's front door. Don't let the dogs get at it. But just, just say, this is from a neighbor who's thinking about you. So what if, what if it's like a whole church every day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, we were blessing ninjas. And then make sure you look at the daily challenges because there's some really simple, doable, cool stuff. And then the third step is, uh, it was mentioned uh, earlier, is this, we can, we can involve, be, engage as local missionaries right here in Traverse City through Freedom Builders. We've got a mission trip right here in Traverse City, June 18 through 22. All the information you need is at the Compassion Table. Go check that out. And then the last thing is um, our, our Compassion Offering, which is going to be on June 24. Um, whether you realize this or not, all of the giving, and we're going we're gonna to do our, our morning offering, so ushers get ready here, but um, our regular offering goes for this mission called Bay Point, because we are our own mission trying to influence the world around us. But we do offerings every now and then that specifically to fund our compassion ministry locally and internationally, and that's coming on June 24. And honestly, I'm, I'm banking that as a result of this, there's going to be a spirit of generosity that wells up in this church, and we're just going to blow the doors off on that on that service. One thing that I have to back up to about the, uh, the, the weekly challenge that I forgot to mention is we want you guys to go be blessing ninjas and then go to the Bay Point Facebook page. If you're, if you're familiar with Facebook, you can just look up Bay Point Community Church. Like us on, on Facebook because we want you guys to tell stories like what happened when you were a blessing ninja. And uh, we want to know what God did in you and we want to know what God did through you. All right, so I hope that you'll participate in that. Now, we're going to close, and Vicki's going to sing a song, and it's, it's a song called, We Are the Body. I mean, if, if we're the body of Christ, uh, saved by grace and empowered by the Holy Spirit to be his hands and feet in the world, you know, the question for us on a very personal level is, what, what are we doing about it? So listen as Vicki sings. Thanks, everybody.
A couple quick things and then we're done. First of all, this is the first Sunday, and every first Sunday of the month, we have a little gathering for those of you who are new to the church. We don't do anything weird. It's just like maybe five or ten minutes. It's a chance for me to say hello and to greet you personally, maybe to find, uh, get some information uh, about the church or questions, and that's over there in the prayer room right after the service. So if you're new, I'd love to have you stop in just for a few minutes and say hello. And then the prayer teams that are normally in that room because every Sunday we know there are people going through stuff where they just need somebody to uh, join them in prayer. And so the prayer teams are going to be down front. So if you need prayer, come on down. And, um, and then if you're new, I would love to have you s uh, step in. Now I'm going to pray um, this, this kind of closing prayer that God turns us into these crazy ninja blessers this week. All right? So here we go. God, thank you for this morning. Thank you that the gospel is not just for heaven when we die, but it's this invitation to an amazing journey of following Jesus and touching people and reaching out and being the hands and feet of Jesus. How cool is that? We get to be purveyors of your love and your grace this week. And I pray that there would be supernatural things that happen that take our breath away. So we pray to that end that your kingdom would come and your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. Break our hearts, O oh God, over the things that break your heart. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody who agreed said, amen. All right, God bless you guys. Thanks for coming.